Adam Newman is back. Infamously, the former CEO of WeWork is back with a new company called Flow. To be honest, I I think he's going to crush it with this company. <laughs> like this is this is a contrarian view yes. here, and we'll we'll see if I'm proven wrong about this. But I think he's going to crush it. I agree. Uh, I I don't want to agree, but I agree. <laughs> All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Atlas Pod. It is Super Bowl weekend. So, of course, this week we will be drinking Bud Light. These guys wow. always have the best commercials of the Absolutely. Super Bowl. Absolutely. Cheers, man. Cheers, buddy. Producer Johnny had a, had a perfect opening of that beer. <laughs> Cracked it at the right time. All right. So, Adam Newman is back. He's back in a big way. So Adam Newman, of course, infamously the former CEO of WeWork, the subject of the great Apple TV Plus show, We Crash, portrayed by Jared Leto, his wife portrayed by Anne Hathaway. Awesome show. Check it out if you haven't seen it. Is back with a new company called Flow. He is uh, doing his first public announcement, first public interview since Andreessen Horowitz, one of the world's top VCs, invested $350 million in this business pre-product. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's their, their biggest check yeah. ever so there's a long hour-long youtube video we have a clip we'll show you guys uh the clip now it's about a minute long uh before cutting uh before breaking it down so number one management company branded technology first number two real estate asset management a company that can buy real estate and asset manage real estate number three financial services and the fourth pillar is this mechanism that's going to take some of the value and share it with the value creators and those users are going to start using our financial services now the reason they're going to use the financial services so that payments company that's charging your rent already has a real relationship with the user and then if we are able to take this value creating mechanism and share with the residents a portion of the value. It's going to make them feel ownership. If you're in your apartment building and you're a renter and your toilet gets clogged, you call the super. If you're in your own apartment and, you're, and you bought it and you own it and your toilet gets clogged, you take the plunger. It's the difference when feeling like you own something to just feeling like you're renting from being trans transactional to actually being part of a community. Okay. All right. So, wow. That was a lot, man. Yeah. A lot to unpack there. What do we think? Uh, so I actually, so this clip, it just got released. It's actually from Andreessen Horowitz American Dynamism Summit, which happened like two and a half months ago in November yep. in DC. I actually watched the whole clip, uh, the whole hour long thing. Yeah. Uh, and I was left with a different reaction than when I watched like the 60 second snippet where basically everyone on social media is just destroying this guy. <laughs> so yeah, curious to hear your take on this. Um, yeah. And, and I'll jump in after. So I think the general public has a really difficult time of separating Adam Newman from the companies that he has been CEO of or is starting. So Adam Newman is in the same sort of group with like Elizabeth Holmes of Theranos <laughs> and Sam Bankman Fried of FTX. But the truth of it is, while he may be a terrible operator of an enterprise grade business, like once WeWork actually became a 30, 40, 50 billion dollar business, whatever was the max, he didn't commit a crime, right? Like he didn't actually defraud anybody or steal their money. He was just shitty at being CEO of a co-working company. And I think he was guilty of a thing that, you know, a lot of founders are guilty of, which is drinking too much of their own Kool-Aid. But when people think about Adam Newman today and why he's getting trashed, you know, on social, it's because they view him as a criminal, right? And that, I think it's, I don't like the guy. Like, I think he's a sociopath probably, but <laughs> he's not, he's not a criminal. And, and I think we, we owe it to, you know, him and we owe it to like just being objective to separate out the two. And when I look at WeWork, you know, we work as a, as a business, he was able to take this from zero to $3 billion in revenue. I mean, we run a startup. I'll tell you right now, going from zero <laughs> to $1 in revenue is a very difficult task, Never mind 3 billion. And this for a moment was at the center of the cultural zeitgeist. Like we work was a company that people cared a lot about and could have been a tremendous thing. 
Um, it was unfortunate how it ended, but now he's back and he's basically doing flow, which if we cut out all the bullshit is we work for apartments, right? <laughs> and so the idea is there is this digitally nomadic culture of young people who want to be able to live and work in different cities all around the world, but they are anchored to a particular city with long leases or if they buy a home or something like that, right? And so the idea for Flow is we'll set up apartment buildings all over the country. So Los Angeles, Austin, Texas, New York, uh, Florida is where they're starting, I believe. And you can pay month to month. But if you want to pick up at any day, if you say, hey, Tuesday, I'm in Miami. Wednesday, I want to be in Los Angeles. You can just go to Los Angeles and you can check into your Flow apartment building. And it's a relatively similar experience, if not better. Um, so it's really playing into a cultural theme of digital nomads. And the whole idea is to take the same sort of party like atmosphere, you know, that like fun community oriented approach that made WeWork so special in the early days and apply it to, uh, to apartment living. Yeah, it's an interesting concept. And I think that last point is what, so like my take after watching the 60 second clip was like, oh, here we go. He's back at it again, talking a big game like just blowing smoke basically, right. A16Z writing a $350 million check. Like what are, we, what are we doing here? And then I went ahead and actually watched the whole hour long interview. And so the first, so this clip comes at like 45 minutes into this hour long thing. Oh, really? The first 45 minutes is a discussion on like what happened after we work, what led Adam Newman to start this company, his interactions with Mark Andreessen, uh, who actually founded Andreessen Horowitz. And that discussion really reminded me of conversations that you and I had about our future of work theme. Yeah. Where we're talking about digital nomads, like you just said, like how the workplace is irrevo irrevocably changed post COVID. Yeah. A lot of the same themes that we've been thinking about inspired him to start this company. And like, what exactly is it? It's, it's, we work for, for homes. And I think there's a technology infrastructure. Yeah. Like so, so what he's getting what he's getting ripped apart for, I think mostly is he goes to talk about their four pillars, right? So the, mm -hmm. there's one one pillar is like a real estate fund that actually owns the properties. Yep. The second pillar is a branded asset management company, and I'll come back to branded. The third pillar is uh, this like finance tech stack payments company, and then the fourth is this value creation mechanism. And I think that value creation thing is kind of what people are poking him at because he's like, well, people will feel like they own these apartments without giving a ton of detail on like what that actually means. Like, is he giving them equity in flow? Is he giving them equity in the properties? Is this like another way of saying rent to own? Right. Like we don't, or, or is it some crypto thing? Cause you know, he's involved with flow carbon as well, right. which is like this uh, crypto carbon tax credit. So like, what exactly is that value creation mechanism? It's a little bit fuzzy. And I think people are kind of on him about that. But to be honest, I, I think he's going to crush it with this company. Like this is this is a contrarian view yes. here and we'll we'll see if I'm proven wrong about this, but I think he's going to crush it. Like this dude at the end of the day, he started a company, it's still a billion dollar market cap company. It was a revolutionary company. It, it changed was. the world. Like people still are out there being like, "Yo, do you want to go to a WeWork today?" whether right. they're talking about spaces, whether they're talking about Neuhaus, like it doesn't matter. That verb WeWork became like a word to use. Right. He's changed the world and when VCs like Andreessen Horowitz think about what kind of founders to back. They're looking for people with big ideas who have the potential to change the world. I mean, you and I talk about this all the time. Yep. So yeah, he, he they got a big check and I think I think he's going to crush it. If he could make WeWork feel like a party, at least how they displayed it in We Crash in those early years, imagine what this guy is going to do with apartment buildings in Miami with young people and swimming pools and parties and totally. crypto. Like, uh, I think he's going to crush. I agree. Uh, I, I don't want to agree, but I agree. <laughs> so look, if people are triggered by the fact that it is so hard for an entrepreneur to raise money, like for your pre-seed round, your seed round, your series A, like getting a million dollar check, getting a $5 million check, like that is a really hard thing to do. Um, we've been fortunate enough to raise 14 million. Like it is a grind, right? And so when a lot of people say, okay, you know, this guy built WeWork into a behemoth and then, and then basically crashed the ship and then his next company, he gets a $350 million check, they're triggered by that. But when you look at it from Andreessen's perspective, it actually makes a ton of sense. Like these guys are in the business of backing companies that they think can be multi-billion dollar businesses. And the truth of it is that VC doesn't scale, meaning 
as you grow your assets under management, Andreessen manages like $35 billion, it becomes really difficult to allocate that amount of capital into small startups, right? So you're writing checks for a million, five million, 10 million bucks. Like think about how many winners you have to have in order to generate the hundred, 500 billion dollar plus returns. But your investors in the VC fund, so Andreessen's LPs, they're saying, okay, well, there's $35 billion in this fund. Given the risk of the asset class, we would expect a minimum 20% per year return. So that means they have to generate $7 billion a year just to justify their existence. So the bet here is we're gonna buy 33% of this company. We're gonna, whatever, write a $350 million check. It's already at a billion bucks. And if he can ramp it from a billion to 30 billion, you know, now we have like multiple years of returns that we need to be able to give to our LPs. So it's a bet on A, the themes that we're talking about, digital nomads, um, people in, in general just wanting to have a more nomadic existence and not be tied to any one particular city or state or country. Um, and this technology play is actually like a really, really interesting angle to this. So prior to Flow, Adam Newman was the largest investor in another um, tech real estate tech company called Alfred. And when I lived in New York, Alfred was part of our services. So you would get on the Alfred app and it would do things like come pick up your dry cleaning, schedule your, your house cleaner to come over, deliver all your packages. It was basically a concierge. Right? I'm, a, I'm an Alfred user. You're an my, Alfred user. My, my apartment is runs on Alfred. That's right. So he basically was the largest investor. And I think he was even on the board of Alfred and saw the growth and basically saw how dope the product is, right? Like normally apartment living is pretty brutal, right? Like at best you get a number to a super and like you're calling mm -hmm. the guy, but he's never available. Like not a lot of like bells and whistles associated with the ongoing service of it. Alfred's the complete antithesis. Most people that use it love it. Most people are willing to pay more to live in a building that has technology, that has Alfred as a technology enablement tool. So he saw the data and he's like, oh, <laughs> Like, let me just divest my Alfred stake and I'll basically spin something else up. Plus I'll own the real estate plus some other bullshit. Um, I mean, you know, the visibility is strong. Like he already knows that this thing is real. Yeah. He, well, he did a ton of research. I mean, so he says, so he's also like one of those guys, you, you called him a sociopath and like, in some sense, he's kind of like a hypnotist. Like he's one of those guys and he starts talking and he throws out these big ideas and he's you know, he talks in a way that is very engaging. Yeah. So like he can he's the kind of guy who can sell, sell you anything. But, you know, his his story that he weaved together was like, all right, post WeWork, I had a ton of cash. Obviously, yep. he he cashed out pretty big from that. Billion he, bucks. So he started he started his family office. Mm -hmm. He started investing. So now he's on the other side of the table. So he's like, oh, shit, I see what it's like to be a VC and try to give advice to founders and they don't listen to me. And he started <laughs> investing in private equity deals. He obviously did uh, the Alfred deal you were talking about. And he also started doing a lot of real estate investing. Right. So this is going to be part of this company. And one of the reasons I think he's going to crush it, he bought over 4,000 multifamily apartments during 2020 right. when the market was, real estate market was slowing down significantly. Rates were at rock bottom. And now he owns all of this real yeah, estate. Yeah, so that's a gonna, great point. So yeah. normally when you're a VC and you're investing in a technology company, you're investing in an idea that is basically a soft, it's basically software. So if, the idea doesn't work out, <laughs> the company's worth zero, right? Like there's not a lot of like assets that go into it. In this case, the company will never go to zero because it's backed by like a real physical brick he's, and mortar He has thing. to be up on almost all of these real estate investments he right. bought in 2020. And yeah, so like the company can't go to zero. And he touched upon another interesting point in, throughout this. And you kind of mentioned it once again with this Alfred thing. Every experience we have as Americans is a branded experience. Mm -hmm. So you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth with a Colgate toothbrush, yep. you drive your Tesla to pick up your Starbucks coffee. Like every <laughs> single thing we have, whether it's a tiny $2 purchase or a $10 purchase, or in the case of a car, a $50,000 purchase, every single thing is branded except real estate. Mm -hmm. So most people just live in a nondescript apartment building and this is the biggest part of their wallet share. People are spending 33, 35% of their income on a non-branded experience. So when he comes in and says, I wanna have a branded asset management company, he's really trying to change that game and start capturing you know, the same kind of network effects and brand 
uh, brand halo effects that some of these other companies have. So, You're not fucking interviewing with me. <laughs> I, I, I mean, like, what is going on? I mean, on? look, I don't know. You watch Adam... Adam Newman, you're not hiring my guys. <laughs> you you watch, right? you watch Adam Newman for too long and you start to drink the Kool-Aid yourself. But no, in all seriousness, like, I think I think it's an interesting company. If I was, if I was a VC betting on someone, I'd bet on someone who knows how to take a company from zero to three billion in revenue as opposed to you know, some of the riskier bets that VCs have to make on unproven founders. Yeah, I agree with all that. I think it's going to be an interesting one to play out. Um, seems like they're they're well on their way right now, 4,000 units. So first of those are going to be rolling out under the flow brand across Miami, Fort Lauderdale, basically East Coast of Florida. Great market to start. Seems like Florida is on, on fire when it comes to people that are moving from New York and other places all around the country. So yeah, um, great starting place, and we'll see what happens. Moving on to a couple earnings this week, Disney. This one, uh, this one's really interesting because Disney has been in the middle of a proxy fight with activist investor Nelson Peltz. He was the second prominent activist investor to uh, to to take a stake and to be pushing Bob Iger to make material changes. The proxy fight's over. Stock popped big this week. I think it was up like 26, 27% from the time that Nelson Peltz and the Tryon team had filed taking a stake in this. And basically they're saying victory. <laughs> yeah. all, all good. Bob Iger took all of our suggestions, implemented them immediately, and we are totally fine with this new path. Um, the one thing that I think is also really interesting is that Bob Iger is saying that Hulu is on the block. And so for those of you guys that don't know, Hulu, obviously a streaming service, was a joint venture initially between Disney, Fox, and NBC, which at the time was owned by Comcast. So the problem for Disney became that they bought Fox in a 60 plus billion dollar merger in the previous Bob Iger era. So that way they acquired a total of 66% of Hulu. But during that period of time, they also built out their own streaming service, Disney Plus. And it doesn't make a ton of sense to have Moana next to like Handmaid's Tale or Snowfall. And somehow NBC Universal has a put option. So they have the right to sell back their stake in Hulu to Disney at a guaranteed valuation of 27 billion bucks. So Disney is on the hook come January of 2024 to pay a minimum of $9 billion to buy out NBC Universal on this deal. Um, so who is going to be on the block? What do we think about that? Yeah, this is a this is a good one. So I want to just quickly talk about this Nelson Peltz Tryon mm -hmm. uh, activist situation. So to up 26%, I think you said, from the lows at which he bought the stock. So just some quick math on this. Disney trading at like 108 bucks. I think the average price, they started buying in November, the average price was like 92 bucks a share. These guys made... 150 million dollars on this trade. I think it's I think it was I think he made 26% basically on just over 1.1 B, so it's yeah. actually 100 million more is more. It's like yeah. 260 270 mil. And in a quarter. And he got out of doing the proxy battle, which right. would have cost him a ton in legal fees. So he got out, he's like, "Yeah, I'm good. This is a he just he crushed that trade." So that was interesting. Um yeah, and on Hulu, so Iger's saying, you know, it's not necessary that they are actually going to buy out the stake. I mean, I think he's ignoring the fact that he has a call option, but they also have the put option. So he's either going to have to buy, <laughs> like he, chances are he's going to have to buy this thing. And maybe he, maybe his aim is to flip it at that point or try to come up with some creative deal. I think my personal view, and once again, throwing out a prediction here, it could be proven wrong. I think he's going to buy it. I think he's just posturing a little bit and, you know, adult content like, the Kardashians, the dropout, which you referenced Elizabeth Holmes, yep. like that is a big, I say adult content. I mean like more, more mature content. Disney, <laughs> Disney's not in the adult content game. That kind of like that market is a big market. And I think, you know, it's obviously not exactly adjacent to Moana and like some of the Disney classics, but like that's a huge market. And I don't think they want to give that up just yet. So we'll see. I mean, Hulu has been slowing down profitability in the streaming business because yeah. of higher production costs and so on. So I understand why he's saying that. You it know, just feels like a distraction though. Like Disney Plus is clearly their bread and butter. Everyone loves it. There seems to be a clear path to profitability. They're guiding Disney Plus to be profitable by calendar year 2024. Yep. Um, it's directly in their wheelhouse as it relates to their IP for the, for the Disney content that they produce, right? So like all of the various cartoon characters and things like that go straight into Disney Plus. Whereas Hulu is a different game. Like they're licensing a lot of this stuff. It's produced by various 
um, production houses all around town. And like you said, it's aimed at a completely different consumer, right? Like it's aimed at a more mature consumer, people that are in their later 20s, 30s, 40s, whatever. So I think that they go through with the purchase of it. They have to pay nine billion, whatever. But then it becomes, how do we get this off the balance sheet? And that, that way, I think, depending on where capital markets are at that point, early 2024, Hulu is spun off and it trades on its own under like the Hulu ticker on whatever, NYSE or, or NASDAQ. The question will be, is the cap, are the capital markets in a place that can support that valuation? We haven't seen any big IPOs in over a year. There's a lot of companies that are out there right now, like Stripe, um, you know, a few other ones that are like, I don't know, at the peak, I think Stripe was 90 billion. They're trying to raise capital right now at a down like 30 or $40 billion round. You would never see that happen any time before 2022. Like these companies would have been public and if they traded down, they would have traded down the public markets. But to be tapping private capital, VC capital at a 60, 70, 80, 90 billion dollar valuation is still insane and goes to show like how how frozen real enterprise capital markets really are still and that's concerning. Yeah, I, I totally agree on that. And I think coming back to Disney for a second and want to hear your take on this. The other interesting piece that came out was this restructuring where now ESPN for the first time is going to be its like standalone reporting segment. So we're going to get we're going to get clean clean numbers on ESPN for the first time and you know people people have all kinds of ideas on what that kind of that kind of business would trade for as a standalone business. I think we'll get a clearer picture on that. Well, now you that, only do now I mean like it. this has been one of those things that we asked for as analysts, we were asking for Google to give us the YouTube numbers, right? For Facebook, we were saying, hey, give us the Instagram numbers. For Amazon, it was give us the AWS numbers. And they don't do it until they know that like they're in a position where those numbers are going to be net positive to the stock price, right? Yep. So like the fact that they're restructuring four different organizations, ESPN is a standalone organization, um, and reporting those numbers clean, you would almost almost guarantee that that's going to be a net positive to the overall share price. And with the removal of the proxy battle, Bob Iger back in the chair, getting this Hulu thing figured out, sorted one way or another. Um, I actually like the stock a lot again. Yeah. I mean, look, it's a holding, it's a holding in our sports and entertainment theme. Let's do it. I'm pretty excited about it. They're talking about reinstating the dividend dividend this year. So yeah, I think, I think it's a, I think it's a long-term winner. I actually have the stock doubling over the long term, I think I think Boom. it's I think it's a it's a pretty good pick. All right, moving uh, along to a highly controversial stock, highly controversial, both in the markets and internally at Atlas. Yep, it's a, it's a highly controversial stock in the markets, and you know they're a main competitor of ours. Robinhood reporting earnings this week. What do you got? Okay, so let me let me run down some of these stats here because I think you know there there were some folks who got excited. I think the stock traded up at some point. Uh, yeah, I think it was let like five percent. Let me let me try to bring people back to reality from a fundamental basis. So, <laughs> MAUs monthly active users down from twenty one point four million in Q two twenty one to eleven point four million. That's a fifty percent decline. Right. Assets under custody, which is how much money is on the platform, down forty percent from one hundred billion to sixty two billion. Transaction based revenue, and this is kind of the part that scares me the most about this business. Transaction based revenue is down sixty percent. From 451 million to 186 million from Q2 20 Q2 uh, 2021 to now. Correct. This is the this is the core of their business. So part of that is masked because now they have this like net interest income, net interest margin business that is kind of boosting up revenue. And I want to go into that a little bit further. But the core of the business is transaction based revenue. Right. That is down tremendously over that time. Another interesting little tidbit that I'll throw out there. I want to get your reaction on. They also had a processing error. I don't know if you saw if you read about this or not. I saw they I saw they somehow got accidentally short a meme stock and lost 50 mil. 57 million because they accidentally shorted a stock and then they had to rebuy it as the price was moving up. Like these are just crazy things to happen at, at that scale. So <sighs> let me let me pause there. I think the business is in a fundamentally much worse place than than it's been in a really long time. It's and clearly crumbling. Not, not not excited about it and can't imagine retail investors are either. Yeah. I mean, anytime you lose half your users, whether you're a social media platform, whether you're a fintech platform, something is obviously wrong. Um, and I think the thing that's wrong is pretty clear. Like, A, they've made some corporate missteps associated with how they treat their users. B, the way that the users use the platform is net negative to their wealth over time, which tells me that they are in the same business as DraftKings and FanDuel. They just either don't know it or won't admit it. 
And look, if you want to get on Robinhood and you want to, you know, gamble with weekly YOLO options or whatever, have at it. But be honest with yourself that you're gambling and you're not investing. And it's very different than using a platform like ours. And our goal is to make it so that you actually make long term wealth, not pretend that you're investing uh, and end up losing, you know, fifty four billion dollars for our users. So it's a very, very different thing um, in terms of in terms of where Robinhood goes from here. Um, one interesting takeaway from their earnings report, it's actually a removal of an overhang, is they're doing a buyback by buying Sam Bankman Freed's <laughs> stake in Robinhood back. So it's a 7%. It, it works out to be about 7% of the company. This had been bought by Sam Bankman Freed when Robinhood was getting crushed and FTX was on top of the world. It's a part of the FTX SBF um, estate liquidation. So it's a net. I don't know if it's like a winner or whatever, but at least some of the some of the users that were affected by FTX will get some cash back. So that's positive. Um, and it's it basically acts as a buyback for them. So I thought that was an interesting. Yeah, that, as well. that is an interesting one. I think it's like a five hundred and fifty million dollar buyback. So mm -hmm. it's pretty significant. The other the other piece that they're trying to do for their shareholders is the two founders, Vlad uh, and Baiju Butt, who's his co-founder. He, they're cutting their share base compensation, five hundred million dollars worth of it. So that should reduce the uh, share count. But it's just an astounding number if you think about how much are these guys getting paid that they're cutting a five hundred million dollar share yeah, base compensation. Was it, number. Wasn't it? It was uh, like it was pre IPO or founder. Yeah, it's their it's that? their founder it's their founder shares. Got it. But still, a pretty pretty significant number. This is, of course, after they laid off like a thousand people last year, and yeah, I, I think I think it's a it's a business in a deteriorating state. I like the phrase that you used: "The more you use it, the more you lose." <laughs> uh, that's that's pretty that's pretty telling. And the other piece the other piece that I want to highlight because I think a lot of people who just read the headlines will miss this. So the company generated one hundred and sixty seven million dollars in net interest margin. So this is just interest that they're earning on cash, whether it's in margin accounts, whether it's securities lending, whether it's cash that's in there. But of that 167 million, the single biggest piece of it, 63 million, was cash in their own corporate account. That's their own balance sheet money. Right, so it's yeah. not like there's that many users who are earning yield because they have this gold program where right, they're offering right. like four and a quarter percent yield or something like that. That number was only like 12 million bucks. Right. The vast majority of it is just their own cash, sitting. cash on balance sheet that's sitting in a high yield savings yeah. account. That's so that's not 4%. like that's not a business. No. Like you know, you have a lot of money and you're you're earning a yield on it. That's not a business model. The business model is a transaction based revenue, which is down sixty percent. Right, and I mean they and they missed revenue. Like they the the reason why the stock was up initially is because they took costs down a bit. Um, but at the end of the day, this this is a company that's always going to trade on top line revenue. They're subject to. Uh, trade volumes, which have continued to been to be pretty anemic uh, throughout Q4 and early parts of Q1 for the retail investor, and they're really trying to make a push into offering more holistic financial services. Right, like they've got this kind of. Uh, I mean, what's called, I mean, it is what it is. It's pretty much a scam where they're telling people like they'll match their 401k, but there's like, you know, a bunch of fine print or whatever, different retirement accounts. Um, they're trying to push into uh, some additional features on the learning side, mm -hmm. but does any of this really change the way that the public perceives them? Like, or, or is this like a good pivot? You know what I mean? Like are, is it a good way for Vlad and the other co-founder to think about this as, okay, the meme stock era is for all intents and purposes over, and we can diversify our product offering to become a fidelity or is the, the ship already sailed? I think it's kind of, a myopic view. Like, I don't think they understand what their public perception really is. Right. I don't, to offer any kind of additional financial products, there needs to be trust in this platform. And I think they eroded that pretty quickly when they, you know, this whole meme stock fiasco where they removed the buy button and they were revealed to be engaging in payment for order flow, you know, and you can, we can have a debate on whether that's a net positive or negative for the consumer. But at the end of the day, that really hurt their brand image. So right. I don't think, I don't think I would be willing to trust Robinhood to place my deposits, to give me financial information, to do any of the additional services they're offering. And I think it's a bit, uh, you know. Well, you also see it in terms of their average account size. Yeah. So like, yes, they serve a lower income consumer. Yes, these people are earlier in their in their life and their career. But still, like the average account size at Robinhood is like $4,000. Actually, I think, it, I think this quarter it dropped to $2,750. So 
people are not putting the majority. I mean, like, even if you're making, you know, 50, 60, 70 grand, most people that, that we've talked to, that our data suggests that like they have a minimum of $5,000 to invest. They're not putting all that money with Robinhood, right? So like there shows that there is a clear differentiation and segregation of the, from the user's perspective of how they want to keep like their real money, hopefully invested at like a reputable wealth management shop or with Atlas or whoever. Um, and what they do with, with, with Robin hood, which is gamble. Right. And I think like, at least that gives me some hope that people aren't really taking all of the money that they should be investing prudently and putting it into Robin hood and gambling in a way. But it does mean that there is a very low glass ceiling on what this business can do. Like if you don't have account sizes that are bigger than two or three grand, you can never be in like the mortgage business, you know, you right. can like never be in anything that's going to be like an asset, a, a balance sheet, intense uh, uh, lending program because you don't have the assets to support it. So if we're betting on Robinhood, if you're betting on Robinhood from a stock perspective, it's just a pure play bet that you're going to get some form of like market, you know, up into the right scenario again, and that retail is gonna come flooding back to it, and that's gonna drive transaction volumes and PFOF. But other than that, I don't really see much here. Yeah, I can I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, we talk about this internally quite a bit. Robinhood did a really good job onboarding people into the investing world, but they did it in a way where people felt like they were playing a game yeah. or gambling. And I don't think the same kind of person who feels like they're gambling on a platform or playing a game on a platform is gonna be like, oh well, let me get a mortgage from these guys. But anyways, enough enough on Robin Hood. Speaking about gambling and games, big weekend, big weekend over here. Super, Super Bowl, Bowl, Super Bowl coming up. One of the biggest sports betting days of the year. I think six American fifty million Americans are supposed to bet sixteen billion dollars on the game. A lot, lot to unpack here with the game, from the advertising to predictions and so on uh what what's your take what's your take on the advertising landscape obviously the economy has been slowing down but i think fox completely sold out uh their ad space for the game what, what's your what's your take uh on, well, on ad mean, revenues the the price of a 30 second super bowl ad continues to go through the roof we're at seven million bucks this year for a 30 second ad up a million dollars in a worse overall advertising environment year over year so clearly big corporations see value in advertising during the Super Bowl. And I really think it's an interesting thing to look at what uh, what people pay for the, for the halftime show, right? Hmm. So there's like a bunch of memes going on saying like Rihanna is doing the show for free. And I just wanted to kind of like break down for people how that really works. So Pepsi sponsoring the halftime show. They paid 50 mil for the honor. Um, NFL gives whoever's performing, in this case it's Rihanna, between 10 and 15 million bucks to be able to spend on production and support of her actual halftime show. And then she gets no salary for it, but she's on there for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So break down, you know, 10 <laughs> minutes, you know, times two times seven, she's basically getting, you know, 20, 30, $40 million of value or whatever for what people would be, what people are paying for advertising space. So, I mean, there's a lot going on in terms of, you know, how, how this is going to work this year. I think one of the interesting things is zero crypto companies are going to be there. <laughs> the best, the best ad last year was the Larry David FTX oh ad. And we have zero crypto companies that are advertising. Yeah. Last year was the crypto bowl. Definitely hands down. Best ad was Larry David one where, mm -hmm. you know, on where he ironically, <laughs> Unironically, or ironically, was doubting uh, was doubting the uh, legitimacy of FTX. But yeah, no no crypto ads this year. Zero dollars. I mean, Coinbase is down like seventy percent from its levels a year ago. I don't think they're they had interested. a good ad though, man. I mean, yeah, like they did. The, it was the moving the moving QR one. code. Yeah, that that was a good ad. Etoro, who was in the Super Bowl last year, no ads. Said they're going to focus on online marketing this year. So. Interesting to see the financial landscape change in terms of advertising from when we're in a bull market to when things slow down. Definitely, definitely a big change of pace. Budweiser, typically the only alcohol to be advertising during the Super Bowl, allowing other liquor companies to be in the mix. We're we're still saluting Bud over here with with the uh, with the drinks today. The unofficial but, sponsor of today's pod. Yeah, unofficial sponsor. <laughs> yeah, in, in, interesting interesting landscape this year. What do you think about the game itself? This one kills me. So um, 
I think the Eagles are going to win, and I have two two reasons why. One, Drake is out with a multi million dollar <laughs> bet on the Chiefs, and he's just the mush. Like you just want to go the opposite way of all things that Drake bets on. Drake, I love you as an artist, phenomenal musician. Yeah, best stay rapper stay, in stay the away game. from our sports teams. Though. Yeah, but when it comes to sports betting, like you are the best tell that anyone could have uh, to go the other way. Um, and then two, there was an interesting stat on on ESPN today talking about Super Bowl MVPs or sorry NFL MVPs playing in the Super Bowl against the number two uh, runner up for the MVP. So this year. It was Mahomes won MVP. Runner up was Jalen Hurts. This has happened three previous times uh, in the past, and all three times the runner up was the winner. The most recent one was when Tom Brady won the Super Bowl, but Matt Ryan had mm-hmm. won the NFL MVP. We all know how that ended. <laughs> ended in tears for Mr. Ryan and the Atlanta Falcons. Matty Ice. Matty Ice. <laughs> yeah. Who so, you got? So you so you got the Eagles. I got the Eagle. I got the Eagles by a field goal. So I was looking oh, interesting. So I was looking at like funny prop bets this year. There are some, there are some hilarious ones. So my cousin works at Caesars and he was kind of giving me the inside mm-hmm. track on some of this stuff. So people are betting on the color of the Gatorade. Apparently it's supposed to be yellow this year. That's a pretty good prop bet. People are betting on Rihanna's first song. What How does the good? Gatorade like there's someone that definitively knows what like Yeah, like, but can't it, you just pay the the equipment guy to tell yeah, you? Yeah, like, so what? apparently the leak is out. Apparently the leak is the out. The leak is out. But the but the funniest one that I saw was that the NFL is scripted, which is because of the interview that came out a few weeks ago. So were pe- there with uh Adrian Foster? Yeah. So right. so people think the NFL is scripted, and apparently according to the script. The Eagles are supposed to win 37-34, so by a field goal. Stop. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the script. So people are people are 37, betting on the, 30, like dude, that's like the like the highest scoring yeah, NFL game ever. 37-34 Eagles according to the NFL script. So, so wait, like, I saw I saw something on this before. So I saw Adrian Foster was on the podcast. Is it Adrian or Aaron Foster? I, I don't know whatever. Uh, Adrian. Yeah. So he was saying that the NFL is basically like WWE and that you get like scripts every single week. It tells you like who catches the ball, you know, who does the touch. The problem with that is like, there's just too much shit yeah. going on out there. There's too many, there's too <laughs> many people doing, it's too uncoordinated. Right. Man. Like it's really hard to, to catch the ball when you're supposed to. And you know, like, I just think it's so ridiculous, but so the script is, is that's, saying that's, that that's what the script supposedly says. Look, I didn't watch the entire interview. I just saw the clip of him saying that. And I don't know, my dude. take on it was that he was joking. I, I assume he was joking. Right. But there were so many hilarious memes that came out as a result of that. So thank you, Foster. This I, feels like this feels like Vegas doing a plant <laughs> just to be able yeah. to get as much money on the, on the Eagles as possible. And Drake, Champagne Poppy is yeah. the one laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah, but look, my official my official pick is Mahomes. Mahomes is going to take it. I know he's got the bum ankle, but I think I think he's got it, man. He's he's just that guy. So yeah, I got I got the Chiefs this year. All right, all right. So I got the Eagles by by a field goal, um, according to the script. It's, yeah, I mean it is what it is, right? Maybe it's a scripted yeah, you, thing. You so. clearly you've clearly read and the you, script, and you got then you got the Chiefs. All right, so. We don't really have to do. What are we watching this weekend? Because we're watching the Super Bowl. Yeah, so that's absolutely. easy, done and dusted. All right, guys, enjoy the Super Bowl. We'll see you next week for another episode of the Atlas Pod. Make sure you like, comment, and share this episode. Mm-hmm.